Personal Finance PowerPoint Presentation Home Buying Activities Overview Get ready to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Remember that we can break out most finance decisions into the short-term decisions and the long-term decisions. Short-term decisions being the ones that we're going to train our gut so we can trust our gut using tools like trial and error tinkering so that we can hone down our habits and make decisions quicker based on basically our gut over time. The long-term decisions are often the areas we're going to focus more on because we're not naturally inclined as human beings as much towards those long-term types of decisions where we have to follow the adage which is measure twice, cut once, spending more time on one particular decision, not being able to depend on tinkering, trial and error, simply training our habits or trusting our gut per se or as the only tool, but rather putting together a formal process for the decision-making process so that we can make a good decision that will have an impact for long periods into the future. For individuals, then, the home purchase is gonna be one of the biggest types of, of financial decisions because it's gonna have one of the longest impacts and one of the largest dollar amounts. So clearly, that is one that we wanna put on the side of measure twice, cut once, try to get it right the first time because what, whatever happens in the future, it's gonna have a longer term uh, impact in the future. So we can think about the process similar to our large purchase kind of processes, but we've uh, got a process just in terms of the home buying, which would be one, determine the home ownership needs. So what are your needs for home ownership? Are you renting uh, versus purchasing decisions that we've talked about in the past? Uh, and now we're focusing in on the purchasing side of things as opposed to the renting side of things. You also kind of just want to think about what is your idea of home ownership, meaning are you purchasing the home uh, for more of an investment purposes? Are you purchasing the home because that's what the, like the, your thought process of what the American dream is, you just should do it? Or are you purchasing the home you know, more for a long-term investment because you are actually going to be using the home as a home for a long period of time and you have a good idea of where that home wants to be and, and where you're going to put the roots down. I would argue, of course, that that last one is the one that should carry the most weight. If you're saying, hey, I'm buying a home because I want to plant my roots here. This is where I want to be. This is where I want to have my family. Everything I need is a, is in this area. And this is where this is where things are going to happen for me. If that's the reason, that's probably the strongest reason. Although, again, obviously finance, just finance reasons and whatnot can be factors as well. Number two, find and evaluate a property to purchase. So clearly then you would be locating the properties that you would be wanting to purchase, price the property. So obviously as you're looking at the locations, you're also comparing that to your budget and trying to determine what types of pros property are available to you within your ranges as you price them, obtain the financing. So then we gotta go through, of course, the financing process because most of the time we're not gonna be paying straight cash for the home, but need to be financing it. And then we're gonna close the purchase process. And obviously this is a longer time stretch to get through this than with many other types of purchases. Are you ready to buy a house? Most of this information can be found at Investopedia, which you can find online. Look up the references, resources, and continue your research from there. If you feel like you're ready to buy a house, the first question you're likely to ask is, how much can I afford? So clearly when we're looking to buy a house, usually we have a fairly good idea of where we want the house to be. That's where we want to put down the roots. And we're asking the question, well, how much is the home in that particular area? It's usually a stretch to think about for most people whether or not they can afford the house. It will typically take financing, something that most people don't have a lot of experience in, or at least not experience to that degree of financing that is going to be needed for the home purchase for most people. So answering that question means taking a look at several factors. Before you snap up that seemingly great buy on a home, learn how to analyze what affordability means. So there's gonna be more questions with regards to affordability than a simple kind of budgeting process. Typically, when you're looking at the home purchase, given the fact that there's gonna be so many factors that are involved, including just the size of the home purchase, the length of the home purchase, how many years it's going to have an impact into the future, as well as the length and size of the financing, uh, the size, amount of financing that's going to be involved and the length of time into the future that that is going to take on. And then, of course, if you get into the non-standard fixed locked down rates, uh, different types of loans, 
that can widen the, the level of complexity greatly quickly. So you'll need to consider various factors ranging from the debt to income, the DTI ratio to mortgage rates, understanding your debt to income uh, ratio first. The first and most important, the first and most apparent decision point involves money. So clearly, do I have the money to be purchasing the home? I'm going to need in part financing to do so. How much financing would be appropriate uh, for me? If you have sufficient means to purchase a house for cash, then you certainly can afford to buy one now. If you have the cash, clearly this isn't a problem. Most people don't have the cash straight up to purchase the home and need some form of financing to do so. Even if you don't pay in cash, most experts would agree that you can afford the purchase if you can qualify for a mortgage on a new home. So clearly we would want to be financing for most people. That means a mortgage. If you put the mortgage in play, then the question is what kind of loan am I going to be taking on? How long do I want that loan period to be? Can I have a fixed rate or a flexed rate and so on and so forth. But how much mortgage can you afford? The 43% debt to income DTI ratio standard is generally used by the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, as a guideline for approving mortgages. So this is kind of like a heuristic, a, a, a debt to income of the 43%. So that's that gives you a, a general idea. That's not like a, a red line in the sand that that's, that's where you want to be, but that's the general place you want to be. And note that when you're looking at uh, financial institutions, they're gonna use their own kind of heuristics in order to see if someone should or have the ability to take up the loan, noting from the finance perspective, from the person that's giving the loan, that that they of course want to make sure that they're going to get paid back. They want to give the loan, but they want to make the interest on it. And they might not have so much assurance on say like your, your actual financial statements because they, they might not be reviewed or anything like that. And so they're going to use possibly percentages on stuff they can verify because you can get a pretty good verification of, uh, of say your income, for example, because you can get that from the W-2s and the tax returns. So this ratio determines if the borrower can make their uh, payments each month. Some lenders may be more lenient or rigid uh, depending on the real estate market and general economic conditions. So clearly the economic conditions can change over time and the regulatory conditions uh, can change over time, which could fluctuate those general kind of heuristics that go into place. So that means that you don't want to be completely dependent on what the bank says that you can take out as a loan. You're not dependent on the bank for your financing. You're going to the bank, or you're not dependent on the bank for your budgeting. You're going to the bank for the financing. You would like from the bank to get as much ability to take out as much loan as you can. And then you want to do your own budgeting to determine how much you can actually uh, afford, right? So a 43% DTI means all your regular debt payments plus your housing related expenses, mortgage, mortgage insurance, homeowners association fees, property tax, homeowners insurance, et cetera, shouldn't equal more than 43% of your monthly gross income. So when we're adding this together, we're not just taking a look at the actual payments for the loan. You've got the other factors that are gonna be involved with the purchase of the home, including the mortgage insurance, if it applies, homeowners association fees, if they apply, property taxes almost certainly will apply and homeowners insurance and that kind of stuff that will be costs that you'll have to deal with going forward even after the initial purchase. For example, if your monthly gross income is 4,000, uh, you multiply this number by 0 0.343, 43% to get 1,720, which is the total you should spend on debt payments. So notice this is kind of an easy way for you to get an idea of one, how much you might be able to afford and two, the, what the bank calculations, their kind of heuristics would be. Once you get this amount, you can try to trim it down to the actual mortgage payment, which we'll do in the practice problems. And then, and then you can actually kind of try to think about how much loan they might be able to give you based on, based on this information because that would be the payment amount for the loan. So this includes not just the loan, but this other stuff. If you could trim it down to the loan payment, then you can use that to determine how much loan you might be able to get if you assume a m the number of years, like 30 years and an interest rate. We'll talk about in the practice problems. So now let's see, 
let's say you already have these monthly obligations. Minimum credit card payments of $120, a car loan payment of $240, a student loan payment of $120, a total of $480. That means theoretically, you can afford up to $1,240 per month in additional debt uh, for a mortgage and still be within the maximum DTI uh, debt to income ratio. Of course, less debt is always better. What mortgage lenders want. So what do you want mortgage lender? You also need to consider the front end uh, debt to income ratio, which calculates your income vis-a-vis -vis the monthly debt and would incur from housing expenses alone, such as mortgage payments and mortgage insurance. Usually lenders like that ratio to be no more than 28%. So this is something that can change from period to period. But if, again, if you know these general heuristics, these general calculations, that can help you to do your estimates, not just for your budgeting, but also try to try to base on how much loan you might be able to get and what the bank is basically thinking on their end. On your end, I would still say you'd want to actually make an income statement right, and see what your monthly expenditures are and your cash flow and so on. So for example, if your income is 4,000 per month, you would have trouble getting approval for 1,720 in monthly housing expenses, even if you have no other obligations. For a front end DTI of 28%, uh, your housing costs should be under 1,120. Why wouldn't you be able to use your full debt to income ratio if you don't have other debt? Because lenders don't like you living on the edge. So another, so they're gonna p try to put some room in there. And just in case anything goes bad, that's gonna be a safeguard that they're gonna be putting into place so that they're safeguarding against you defaulting on the loan. Financial misfortunes happen. You lose your job. Uh, your car gets totaled, a medical disability prevents you from working for a while. These kind of things, they want to make sure on their end, they're safeguarded on their side uh, of it. And you might say, well, they're safeguarded because my house is on the on the line for, for collateral. But they don't really want to foreclose on the home. No one wants to do that, really. They, they want to get paid and, and make, make loans that they can be sure to be paid on. Now, of course, as the market changes, banks might take on more risky or less risky loans depending on the market conditions and so on. But in any case, if your mortgage is 43% of your income, you'd have to wiggle room for, for when you want, to, you would have no wiggle room for when you want to or have to incur additional expenses. Most mortgages are long-term commitments. Keep in mind that you may be making those payments every month for the next 30 years. So clearly there's a long time frame going forward and you know they, they, you want enough, what they say, wiggle room here, enough cushion so that uh, if there was a problem, you're not just right on the edge. You're just barely making the payments because it's likely that something's going to happen within the 30 years. Hopefully things get better. Hopefully your income goes up and you make the payments more easily and the house value goes up and you have more equity in the home and whatnot. That's what everybody plans on. But you know, there's going to be some people where that didn't, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go the other way. And so you want some cushion. So accordingly, uh, you should evaluate the re rely, uh, reliability of your primary source of income. So this is another thing that, you know, the bank is going to be quite concerned oftentimes when you have like a business income, like a sole proprietorship, for example, because it doesn't feel as steady, especially if it's a newer type of business than if you had like an established W-2 income at a job that you've been at for the last 10 years or something like that. And you're on a, you've got, if you're locked in and you've got a standard increase and we know exactly what the increase in your income is going to be and so on and so forth, that to a lender is going to look a lot more, a lot more, you're going to feel a lot better about it <laughs> than, uh, than oftentimes the business income, which looks a little bit more like it could, it could fluctuate. So you should also consider your prospects for the future and the likelihood that your expenses will rise over time. Everybody's expenses are going to rise over this time. We got some inflation going on. But in any case, can you afford the down payment? It's best to put down 20% of your home price to avoid paying private mortgage insurance, PMI. So the standard down payment is usually 20%. So if you if you keep to the standards, then it's usually easier. It's kind of like uh, you might compare it to say if you're buying a car and you're buying a new car versus kind of kind of a used car, 
if you the new car is kind of easier to buy oftentimes because it's the standard you know what they bought it for you know what the new cars are kind of going for and so on if you stick to the standard kind of financing practices it usually is the easier way to go there too because from financial institution to financial institution you're comparing apples to apples the same thing to the same thing so they're usually fairly fairly similar over there so what you would like to do is say i've got solid credit i'm going to put 20 percent down i've got a, a reasonable loan i'm going to put it over the 30 year time frame and then the rates will be you could be fairly you could shop around for the, the for the rates with some assurance that they are you know the appropriate market rates for that given time once we start changing things tinkering things go down to 10 percent on the down payment or we or we start to say i want a lower interest rate by making it variable or we change possibly not the the length of the loan isn't too bad if you go from a standard 30 to like a 15 that's still fairly standard but if you go to a, a, a weird kind of payment schedule then that that makes things you got to be more diligent in, in checking everything out obviously when you put 20 percent down that is good for the bank because the bank wants to be able to say even if the house goes down in value if you stop paying for it they could foreclose on it and they could still they could still recover the home value even though the home value has gone down because you paid down 20 percent it also shows that you have committed by putting down 20 percent you're less likely to just walk away from the home in that case and therefore you know that's why they want that down payment so usually added into your mortgage payment the PMI can add $30 to $70 to your monthly mortgage payment for every 100,000 borrowed. So if you have to get the mortgage insurance, um, the private mortgage insurance, then of course that's gonna be another increase and that's gonna give security to the lender given the fact that you don't have that, they don't feel that security from the down payment so they want the security in the form of insurance. Uh, so there may be some reasons that you might not want to put down 20% towards your purchase nobody wants to but that's that's what you got that's what you have to do otherwise it's worse oftentimes so <laughs> perhaps you aren't planning on living in the home very long have long-term plans to convert the home into an investment property or you don't want to risk putting that much cash down uh, if that's the case buying a home is still possible without 20 percent down you can buy a home with as little as 3.5 percent down with an fha loan for example but there are bonuses to coming up with uh with more so you, you know again you could of course put less down obviously the lender is going to be skeptical if you put less down for the most part because you know th these these types of reasons well you don't want to put much cash down you don't want to be tied down to the risk you, you know you might want to change the property and this these are obviously bad things to the lender the lender wants to hear that you're that you're going to be buying the house for the 30 years so they're going to take on more risk and usually that would involve uh you know other other kind of costs that could come into play now if you if you bring in in the fha again you, you might have, you have different kind of complications involved with regards to that we might talk more about that in future presentations so in addition to the aforementioned uh avoidance of a of pmi a larger down payment also means smaller mortgage payments for a 200,000 mortgage with a four percent fixed rate fixed interest rate for a 30-year term you would pay 955 dollars if your mortgage were 180,000 with a four percent interest rate for a 30-year term you pay uh, 890 and 59 dollars so clearly if you put more money down up front that means you're going to have a smaller loan in this case we're talking a two hundred thousand dollar loan versus a one hundred and eighty thousand dollar loan even if you got the same rate with the two loans then of course if you have a higher loan you're paying more interest on it you're going to be making more payments in general you're going to be paying more uh interest over the term of the loan you might think well why doesn't the bank like that you would think that the bank might want to give me a two hundred thousand dollar loan instead of a hundred and eighty thousand dollar loan because i would be paying them more interest over time which is true and they would like that if they could guarantee that you are going to pay them the more interest over time the problem is that if if you got a two hundred thousand dollar loan on a two hundred thousand dollar home you're not invested in the home like you could like the, you could walk away from the home and not feel like you lost anything right because you didn't really put any money on it if, if something went uh went down went went bad on it whereas if you put 20 percent down if you put twenty thousand down on, on that home 
you're invested in the home and the home could go down in value under 200. What if the market went down? Then now you're gonna have a loan that's higher than the value of the home and your likelihood of walking away from it is higher. And if you did walk away from it, the, home, the, the lender wouldn't be able to sell the home for enough to pay off the, the, the loan and they'd have to deal with the, the selling costs and whatnot. So there's risk involved with that. So if they could if they could guarantee that you were gonna pay them the 200,000, then yeah, they would make more interest, but the risk involved in it makes it not worthwhile when you play it out. So more choices among lenders. Some lenders won't offer a mortgage unless you put at least 5% to 10% down. Being able to afford a new house today uh, is not nearly as impossible as your ability to afford it over the long haul. The housing market. Assuming you have your money situated under control, your next consideration is uh, housing market economics. So the economics of the housing market, quite complex clearly, because it's kind of intertwined with so many other things because the government puts in policies that influence the housing markets, which might be based in part on lobbyists. So clearly we could see that in the tax code with the, the interest being deductible and property taxes and, and this kind of stuff that complicates uh, the, the, the calculations for buying a home. It also complicates the housing markets, the rises and falls in the housing markets. If you look at them over time, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. But obviously there's a lot of incentives going on, including like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and different you know, incentive programs on housing purchasing and tax breaks and whatnot. So that all that stuff kind of complicates the housing market even more than it already would be complicated. So either, either in your current locale uh, or the one you're planned to move. So clearly the housing market also, you can think about it from a national standpoint, but then you want to narrow down to the local standpoint, what's the housing market where you stand. And those two things are not always in alignment. The, the overall housing market in the country has a general influence possibly on the whole country, but the housing market for a particular place is going to be unique to that particular place. So a house in this is an expensive investment. Having the money to make the purchase is excellent, but it doesn't answer whether or not the purchase makes sense from a financial perspective. So if you can afford the home in some way, shape or form, house or finance or money or finance, cash or finance, the question is still, is it a worthwhile decision? I think that decision's a lot more easy if you're saying I have the money to do it or and or I have the ability to finance and this home is exactly where I want to be. I want to put my roots down here. I want to be here. This is this is where I, this is what I plan on doing. Then, you know, if you're going to own the home for the 30 year time frame, even if the home value fluctuates and it goes up and down, as long as you can make the payments, you feel, you know, you're good. You feel pretty good about it, at least from a cash flow standpoint, even if the housing market went down, it wouldn't really devastate you because it's not going to hurt your cash flow. The more and more that your home is being purchased just simply for kind of like an investment standpoint, and you're going to feel the pain every time the house market fluctuates up or down because you're planning on moving soon or you want to flip it or you want to sell it, then of course that more and more the housing market comes into play and it becomes more significant of a decision factor. So uh, one way to do this is to answer the question, is it cheaper to rent than buy? If buying works out to be less expensive than renting, that's a strong argument in favor of purchasing. So obviously if you compare the renting process through to the purchasing process, then you might just see from a financial perspective, you're like over, the, over my time frame, purchasing is cheaper. That would be an, an indication that the purchase, at least from a financial perspective, would be a good place to go if you are comfortable with being in that place for a long period of time if you if that's the thought process so similarly it's worth thinking about the longer term implications of a home purchase for generations buying a home was almost a guaranteed way to make money so uh, in prior generations you know buying a home was like the one of the biggest investments that you can have because property was just going up all the time and it was kind of you get to the point where these housing cycles go up for a long period of time and people start to think that they can never go down, but uh, clearly they do go down at some point. It's just a very long cycle of increasing and decreasing uh, in the in the housing markets. So it, it may not be the same, you know, whatever you grew up with, the housing market that you happen to grow up with might not it might not be how it currently is. You got to see what what is, what is it like right now. So your grandparents 
could have bought a home uh, 50 years ago for $20,000 and sold it for five or 10 times that amount 30 years later. While real estate has traditionally been considered a safe long-term investment, recessions and other disasters can test that theory and make would-be homeowners uh, think twice. So, so that shouldn't really, I don't think that should scare people away from the home ownership if you're buying the home in order to use the home. If you're buying the home to live there for 30 years and you know raise a family there and everything you got everything you need around there, then the fluctuation of the house prices, like it's amazing if that the house prices goes up 10, I mean, I've seen this, this is my experience in the where, where, I, where I lived with my parents' generation, but it didn't really have a whole lot of impact on, on them, at least during the years that we were growing up because they weren't selling the home they were just paying down the payment and as long as you could pay down the payment you know the, your cash flow is the same it has a huge impact at retirement because there's they could they could sell the home and move somewhere else if they want and it went up hugely but if if you're buying the home to live in it and the home didn't go up by you know 10 times or whatever but you you got good use out of it for 30 years and you're able to make the payments then you know, it served its purpose in that case, you, you would think you might you might make the argument. So during the Great Recession, many homeowners lost money when the real estate market crashed back in 2007 and ended up owing homes that were worth far less than the price at which they were purchased for many years after. So this is the, the housing recession, not the Great Depression. I hope I didn't say the Great Recession. Uh, and this is was was uh, the, the housing bu bubble broke. And again, you can get into a lot of details in terms of it's really interesting why why did this housing bubble kind of happen? It's really an interesting kind of thing to get into, but there's a lot of factors that are going to be involved in it, including secondary markets, government government kind of influence, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, influencing it, and you can see these changes in the financing terms as a result that seem weird. Like why would that happen because of all these other influences that are happening? Like putting no money down and having low interest rates and what and whatnot and so so that's an interesting topic to look at but just that means that the housing markets can go up and create quite a bubble and then and then go back down we've seen that in in other economies as well so whenever the housing market seems way overpriced you would think that it might be at least at some term but you never know when <laughs> when it will turn around so so if you are buying the property on the belief that it will rise in value over time, be sure to factor the cost of interest payments and your mortgage upgrades to the property and ongoing or routine maintenance into your calculations. So you're still going to have monthly costs that are quite significant with maintenance and so on when you're living in the home even after you purchased it. The economic outlook along those same lines, there are years when real estate prices are depressed and years when they are uh, abnormally high. If prices are so low that it is obvious you are getting a good deal, you can take that as a sign that it might be a good time to make your purchase. In a buyer's market, depressed prices increase the odds that time will work in your favor and cause your home to appreciate down the road. For example, if history repeats itself, we may see drop in home prices due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its dramatic impact on the economy. So I won't try to completely speculate the economy here. You can look into a lot of other factors on that. But clearly we have a situation here with the whole COVID situation that's having, you know, the economic impacts that it's having. And that's going to cause, you know, weird distortions all over the uh, economy, including in the housing. We also see that at this current point in time, it looks like because of you know all the spending and all the other kind of stuff that's going on supply chain issues and whatnot that they're they're having an inf in, uh, inflation issue which means the purchasing power of the dollar is going down that ha that's part of the reason that the prior generations home values went up so much is because <laughs> it's because they were going through an inflationary period like in the 70s we had an inflationary period and uh, and the home relative to the dollar if you own the home relative to the dollar then uh you're, you could end up in a in a beneficial situation there but everybody in my generation is thinking that at this point in time given given you know their prior generation so given that you don't you're not sure that that's exactly how things will play out but you would think if obviously if if there's an inflationary time period and you had the home and you locked down the rate uh, in the home that the home might retain its value in 
alignment or compared to the rise in the dollar, which would be beneficial over time. But again, that's going to cause weird implications in the market because a lot of people are going to be thinking that you would think. So interest rates, interest rates, which play a, pro a prominent role in determining the size of a monthly mortgage payment also have years when they are high and years when they are low, which is better. So notice I, that. So we're probably going from low, epic low rates for a long time to rates that are going to increase. Many people are projecting that they're going to increase for a good time into the future the, the the idea there was terms at the time of the recording this they were saying it's transitory it's transitory for like but it's not, meaning it's going to terminate some but it doesn't look the more and more it doesn't look like that so uh, we'll see if the interest rates get out of control or if they're able to tamp them down it'll be an interesting little epic we have here so for example a 30-year mortgage the 360 months on 100,000 loan at three percent interest will cost you 422 per month at a 5% interest rate, it will cost you 537 per month. At 7%, it jumps to 665. So imagine a situation, and this is what kind of happened in my parents' generation. If you got the loan and you locked the rate down at like a lower rate, like at the 3% in this case, and then five years later, the rate that other people are purchasing a home at is at 7%. All of a sudden, your, your loan looks a lot better because you locked it down at the 3%. And now people are getting financing that's way over that point in time. For the last a long time, like 10 years, you know, the, the rates have been kind of like going down. So people have been refinancing, refinancing. They started at higher rates and then refinancing down to the lower rates. It looks like we're in an inflationary period. And that means that if you lock down the lower rate, then later on, the rates are going to go up. People that are getting loans later up are going to have to pay higher rates. So... Uh, so if interest rates are falling, it may be wise to wait before you buy. Uh, if they are rising, it makes sense to make your purchase sooner rather than later. So there's a lot of interesting kind of components to that rate increasing and decreasing because you also have to take into consideration how, how much cash can you pay, right? I mean, because there's also going to be adjustments to the home prices depending on the rates as well, which will have an implication if you could pay the actual cash for it. Uh, then of course you might want to pay the cash when the when the when the the value of the home is is lower to be making the purchase. Time of year, the seasons of the year can also factor into the decision making process. Spring is probably the best time to shop if you want the widest possible variety of homes to choose from. Part of the reason relates to the target audience of most homes families who are waiting to move until their kids finish the current school year but want to get settled before the new year starts in the fall. If you want sellers who may be seeing less traffic, so you got less traffic involved, which could make them more flexible on price, winter may be better for house hunting, especially in cold climates, or the height of summer for tropical states. In other words, the off season is what we're talking about here. Inventories are likely to be smaller, so choices may be limited, but it is also unlikely that sellers will be seeing multiple offers during this time of year. So if you're on the off season, there might not be as much out there, but you got, well, the ones that are out there might have less you know, traffic and offers related to them, making the process a little bit easier, possibly in some cases, depending on what you're looking for. However, it is worth noting that some savvy buyers also like to make offers around holidays such as Christmas or Easter, hoping that the unusual timing, lack of competition, and overall spirit of the season will get a quick deal done at a reasonable price. Consider your lifestyle needs. While money is an important consideration, many other factors could play a role in your timing. Is your need for extra space uh, imminent? A new baby on the way? An elderly relative who can't live alone? So you might have other needs, of course, that will increase your your timing needs. And you got to do what you got to do within that timing framework that, of course, could uh, impact your decision making process. So does the move involve your kids changing schools? Uh, if you'll be selling a house in which you've lived for less than two years, would you incur capital gains tax? So if you're selling your home, the taxation of it can be important if you don't get that huge ex exclusion. And if so, it is worth waiting to avoid that bite. So you may love the cook with the gourmet ingredients, take a weekend gateway uh, every month, uh, patronize your performing arts, or work out with a personal trainer. None of these habits are budget, uh, budget killers. 
but you might have to do without them if you bought a home based on a 43% debt to income ratio. Before you practice making mortgage payments, give yourself a little financial elbow room by subtracting the cost uh, of your most expensive hobby or activity from the payment you calculate. So notice that we're using when you're using this 40%, again, I would use that 43%. I would try to use it as a heuristic for the banking side of things and then do your own budgeting on your side of things. Try to actually factor in what your income costs are and then determine how much more costs you're going to have for the home and, and then try to and see if you're living within that budget. If you're not, then don't expect that you can just, you know, change your habits like overnight because you, you can't. Their habits, they're going to take a while to change. So if there's going to be a significant change in your lifestyle, then you got to take that into consideration. You're going to probably want to start implementing that before the purchase so that you know what that change feels like. So if the balance isn't enough to buy the home of, of your dreams, you may have to cut back or start thinking of a less expensive house as your dream home. Selling one home, buying another. If you are selling a home and plan to buy another, save the proceeds from your current home in a savings account and determine whether or not after factoring in other necessary expenses like a car payment or health insurance, you will be able to afford the mortgage. It is also important to remember that additional funds will be allocated for maintenance and utilities. So whenever you make the purchase, don't just factor in the mortgage payments. You're gonna have those other costs that you'll have to be putting up each month for the, for the house. Those costs will be undoubtedly uh, be higher for larger homes. So if you're going from a, a smaller rental place to a larger home, then you gotta budget in the fact that you're gonna have these costs for just simply the utilities and then the maintenance, which might not be something that you're factoring in on a rental, for example. When you calculate, I use your current income and don't assume you'll be making more money down the road. So oftentimes we're, we go into a new home and we say, yeah, I, I can barely do it right now, but I'm going to make more money in the next five years. I'm planning on a substantial increase in my work and my prestige and whatnot. <laughs> and that's hopefully that happens. But uh, you'd like to kind of budget for the for a worst case scenario, too, or at least take that into your risk analysis that things can go the other way. And you want to make sure that if that is the case, that you at least have some cushion that you would be you could go forward with that. Uh, raises don't always happen and careers change. Uh, if you base the amount of home you buy on future income, you might as well set up a romantic dinner with your credit card uh, as you'll end up in a long lasting relationship with them. <laughs> it's OK. However, if you can handle these extra house costs without extra credit card debt, you can afford to buy a home as long as you have saved up enough money for your down payment. So do you plan to save? Affordability should be the number one thing you look for in a home, but it's also best to know how long you want to live there. If not, you could get stuck in a home you can't afford in a city or town you're uh, ready to leave. So clearly when you're purchasing the home, you want to think about how long you're going to be in the home. That could be a little bit different than the long term, the loan terms. You might be taking a 30 year loan to finance the home, but actually still be thinking you're going to sell it in five years or something like that. So you want to take a, take a look at how long you're going to be there. Many financial experts suggest living in a home for five years before selling it as a guideline. Don't forget to factor in the cost involved with buying, selling and moving. So clearly the cost of moving from house to house will be more than just, you know, the sales price. You got to consider all the factors that are going to be involved in that. Also, consider the break even point for the mortgage fees associated with the home you are selling. If you can't decide what city or town you'll live in and what your five year plan is, it may not be the right time to buy a home. If you want to buy a home without a five year plan, purchase one price much lower than the maximum you can afford. You'll have to be able to afford to take a hit if you have to sell it quickly. Another exception, if you work for a company that buys relocated employees' houses, uh, one name for this is a guaranteed buyout option. So how much house can I afford? So how much can you get for the house? We will do some calculations on this, some practice calculations so you can get an idea how, how you might go about that in our practice problems. You should examine your income, savings for a down payment and closing costs 
and reoccurring debt to figure out how much house you can afford to buy. The 43% debt to income ratio stand standard is a good guideline for being approved and being able to afford a mortgage loan. So again, you can use that 43%. That's like the heuristic that a financial institution such as a bank might use. But again, you probably, that's not really where you wanna stop most likely. You wanna look at your actual your actual spending habits because that 43% is, is basically their heuristic that they're applying to everybody. You might be a person that has, has higher spending habits or lower spending habits than that, that you're comfortable with. And, and you get a much better idea of that if you actually you know budget out what you're currently spending what, and what you expect the costs to be and just do like an, a monthly income statement, for example. How does buying a house work? Buying a house is often among the most significant purchases in a lifetime. When you find a house you want to buy, you should first figure out if you can afford it, then ask your lender for a pre-approved letter, which means the lender believes you are likely qualified for a mortgage loan, and then you can make an offer. If the seller accepts your offer, you will need to take several next steps, including paying a down payment and having your mortgage loan approved by an underwriter and lender. What is the 2838 rule? The term 28-38 rule is a guideline used by underwriters and lenders uh, used to see if you can afford the home you want to buy. In general, this rule is considered one of the best ways to calculate the amount of mortgage payment debt you can afford based on your income. So once again, this is kind of a heuristic by the financial institutions to see if, if they can afford the the loan. Many learn lo many lenders require that potential home buyers maximum household expense to income ratio is 28% with a maximum total debt to income ratio of 36% in order to be approved for a mortgage. The bottom line, you you are ready to buy are you ready to buy a home? In short, yes if you can afford to do it but afford isn't as simple as what's uh, in your bank account right now a host of other financial and lifestyle considerations should figure into your calculations when you factor in all these elements if you can afford to do it uh, it starts looking more complicated than uh, it first appears to be but considering financial factors before you purchase can prevent costly mistakes and financial problems later so again it's one of those items long-term purchase affecting multiple periods into the future adage measure twice cut once on that one